morning we will continue with this matter of the two spirits. And we'll talk about the difference between the spirit and the soul. Mm. How many of you know what the difference is? Mm. Oh, what do you think? Well, I think all living things are a soul, but not a living spirit. <laughs> That's right. All right. So just a brief recap. Last week uh, we talked about the two spirits uh, with Dion. And uh, he presented this marvelous picture which shows us the process that God went through. Uh, first he was God, and then he became God incarnate. Right? It says that the Word became flesh, so he became a man. But when he became a man, he didn't cease being God. Right? So he was a God-man. And on this earth, he went through human living. And he lived a normal human life, yet because he was God, there was also something different in mm -hmm. his life. You could really see God's divine attributes being expressed in his human living. And then he went to the cross and died and he was crucified. Um, and in that crucifixion, he accomplished a marvelous redemption for us. Right? Um, and then he was put into the grave and he resurrected. And in his resurrection, I think we saw that that was not only a victory over death and Hades, but in his resurrection, he became a life-giving <coughs> spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he also brought forth the many sons of God. So actually, we were all born again uh, as sons of God in his resurrection. And then he ascended to the highest place in the universe, where he became, um, what we saw with Tim, the ruler of the kings of this earth, the Lord of all. And then also, after his ascension, he came and he poured himself out uh, as the spirit onto man. And so through this process, one of the key things is that the Lord became the life-giving spirit. Mm -hmm. And so just as when he became a man, he was still God, when he became the life-giving spirit, he still he brought in all of the previous processes that he had went through. Mm -hmm. So it is the spirit today, there's his human living, there's his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension. And we saw how we can experience even his resurrection, because today he's the spirit that's one with us. Now, this life-giving spirit is being dispensed into our human spirit. So this is another picture. Um, so you recall now that the Lord comes into us as the spirit. And again, not just the Holy Spirit with only divinity, but the Holy Spirit with all these wonderful elements, all these wonderful riches, are now being dispensed into our human spirit. Amen. 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 <laughs> Any questions on this? So today we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between the spirit and the soul. Right? So this is wonderful process where God is pouring out everything that he has as the spirit into our spirit. So first of all, the spirit being different from the soul. Uh, can someone read to me, uh, let's see, Sam, I need you to read in a loud voice, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. <coughs> Let God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete, without blame, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So now this verse is really critical because it shows us that man has these three parts, spirit, soul, and body. And it's really helpful because this word sanctify you wholly, sometimes it's translated through and through or completely, but the Greek word means like the complete part, right? And so that's how you know that when he names these three things, those are the three parts of man. Right? Does that make sense? Um, so God, please sanctify you wholly. Right? And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved. Right? Be sanctified. Okay, so Emma, can you read uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 14 to 15? Read that in a loud voice. But a soulish man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he is not able to know them, because they are discerned spiritually. But the spiritual man discerns all things, but he himself is discerned by no one. So this is another verse showing us that you can be a soulish man or a spiritual man, according to the word. So there definitely is a difference between the spirit and the soul. So now, if we look at this picture, right, we have the spirit, soul, and body. Um, let's... Let's dive in a little bit and talk about uh, and look at each of these parts. And so, with the soul, there's actually three parts. We have the mind, 
the will, and the emotion. And you can see all of this in, throughout verses in the Bible. And so, uh, underneath that part that says we're sharing our screen, <laughs> it's the mind. <laughs> so, <clears throat> right there you can see that, that these verses show us that the soul has the function of the mind. That it knows, it considers, it remembers things. It's where knowledge is stored. Additionally, the soul has the part of the will, which is the part that chooses, that wants something, that decides things, that seeks after things, that makes decisions. And so we also have our will, right? Your preferences, uh, your desires, your decisions, those are all part of your soul. The third part is the emotion. And so our soul is a place for our emotion. You can see in the Bible many times the soul is referred to with love, hatred, joy, grief, and desire through all these verses, right? So your emotions, happiness, anger, hate, that's all tied to your soul. Similarly, with the spirit, there are three parts as well. So with the soul, there's the mind, the will, and the emotion. And then with the spirit, we have our fellowship, we have intuition, and we have conscience. So with the conscience, there's some verses here that show us the part of our spirit that's the conscience. So you have Romans 9.1 and Romans 8.16 with the conscience bearing witness. And then in 8.16 he says, I bear witness in my spirit. If you put those verses together, you see that it's the conscience, the spirit as the conscience bearing witness with the spirit. Right? The spirit can judge. The spirit has a right and contrite. The spirit can be hardened in the same way that our conscience can be hardened. Mm -hmm. The other part of our spirit is the intuition. And so, um, <clears throat> let's see, 1 Corinthians 2.11, right? So, to worship in spirit, our best, so I think that's actually to know the deep things of God. Right? Oh, yeah. um, so that might be, uh, that needs to be changed. But in the spirit, we can have an intuition. Now this word is tricky, because I think a lot of people say, oh, I'm pretty intuitive. <laughs> and uh, they're not really talking about their spirit when they say that. So what we mean by intuition is what the Bible means in these verses, which is that you can have a direct sense of the real situation or, um, of the real situation according to a direct knowledge in your spirit. Right? So the Lord, um, he perceived in his spirit, he sighed deeply in his spirit, which means that in his spirit is what he is where he had the reaction to the situation. So the intuition is a direct knowledge that comes directly from your spirit. Now fellowship is another part of your spirit. Uh, John 4, 24, we worship the Lord in spirit. Romans, he says, I serve God in my spirit. So our spirit has very much to do with the fellowship of God, serving God, worshiping God, praying, right? We're joined to the Lord in one spirit. So our fellowship, our prayer, our worshiping, our serving, all of that is in spirit. Right? Our spirit has that part. So, we see that we have three parts to our soul. We have three parts to our spirit. The three parts of the soul are our mind, our will, and emotion. The three parts of our spirit are what? Fellowship. Fellowship. Yeah, I gave you the easy one. I should have asked you the three parts of the soul. <laughs> Jesus answers to that transgression, right? And then that 
It's like that window now that's all hazy gets quite clean with the spiritual index. Right? You get that quite clean, and now the window's clear, and now between your spirit and your soul, you can have the fellowship and the intuition. So these are the four parts of our heart. There's actually also functions of these three. Right? The heart is the loving organ, the spirit is the receiving organ, and the soul is the reflecting organ. much we could say about this, um, but just know that there's also the function related to the different parts of our being. So, why is it good to know all these things? Um, there's a lot going on. There's actually a lot going on. Can anyone tell me the three functions of the conscience? Most people only know the first function, but um, there's a lot going on, right? So why does it matter? So. I think I was going to use Brian for this example, but he's gone at me, so he gets a pass. I was going to use Brian because he really likes cars. So I don't know if there's anyone else who really likes uh, cars. Maybe we should all take them up here. Of uh, course. Oh, I'll come back to that. Okay, so. Oh, wow. Here's a slide on how to start a car. So I, I did a. Um, I put together some, some pretty good research here <laughs> on how you start a car. And I know you like cars, you know a lot about cars. So can you yeah. go through these 10 steps and kind of teach the rest of us about how we start a car? Uh, sure. I mean, normally I skip to step three, just insert the key and make sure. You've got to go through all these steps. So all right. One. So why don't you read that? Set the, uh, the, AC, the AC to medium cool. You know. I don't have a medium cool setting on my car. <laughs> but okay, uh, turn on hazard lights, uh, insert key in the ignition, turn off hazard lights, uh, set the parking brake, pump the brakes three times, <laughs> and then hold. <laughs> hold the oh, this is a manual car. Hold the clutch. It's all applicable. So if you're a manual, you have to do step seven. Oh, Otherwise, if the car's on a manual, you can go to step eight. Right. Uh, turn the ignition on. Uh, release the parking brake and toggle high beams, high beams twice. Uh, wow. So this is, this is how you start a car, right? Uh, <laughs> this is what I, 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 I do this. It works oh. every time. Oh, yeah. Every time I do these, the car starts. <laughs> I guarantee if you do these 10 steps in that order, your car will start too. Yeah. Oh, that's true. <laughs> so, I mean, that's how you start a car, right? Uh, wait, well, what if you just did step I bet I could do this in your eight. car, it would work. It would, it would work. work. It would work. <laughs> You're telling me I only have to do step three and step eight. Yeah, those. Yeah. I tried eight; it didn't work. <laughs> but your key is in the ignition. No, well, but if I do that, then I might as well do four, five, six, and seven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You, thanks, Kushal. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I use this illustration because I think a lot of times when we talk about exercising our spirits. Exercising our soul. This is actually how we are. Mm. So if you want to start the car, you just have to turn the engine. Yeah. The spirit's like the engine. So do you know how to start the engine of your car? Yeah. But a lot of times, I think that we're a little bit like this because we don't know experientially or practically the difference between our spirit and our soul. Right. And so we think like, oh, you know, the AC is related. I gotta like flip the AC. I've gotta flip the hazard lights, and then. Oh, I touched my spirit! Yes! Right? And so you're like, okay, now I know how to touch my spirit. Next time I'm gonna call the Lord five times. I'm gonna jump and shout. I'm gonna put my arm to the left and to the right. <laughs> and then I know how to touch my spirit. Right? So this is why, this is how we are sometimes. So this is why we need to know the difference between the spirit and the soul. Right? If once you know, and you have like the instruction manual, you realize, okay, so the spirit is like the engine. And that's different than the transmission. That's different than the clutch. It's different than the steering, right? And once I know that, then I know how to turn on my spirit. I know how to exercise my spirit. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I know how to function. I know the function of my soul. So it's really good to have a, um, an understanding of these things. So we need to know, like, how do we exercise our heart towards the Lord? How do we exercise our spirit and touch the Lord and fellowship with Him? And we need to know not just the different functions of the hearts, but we need to know experientially. Now, there, in some ways, um, it isn't wrong necessarily, right? We actually need to exercise our heart along with our spirit. Um, and so when you wake up in the morning, sometimes you might be like, we need to touch the Lord in spirit. You know, like, it's not working. How many of you have that? Well, did you know that in order for you to touch the Lord in your spirit, you have to actually exercise your heart? there's actually four things that you need to take care of in order to exercise your heart. It says in Corinthians that whenever the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And so sometimes we have trouble exercising our spirit because our heart is a turn to the Lord. So the first thing we got to do is turn our hearts to the Lord. There's three other things. Your heart is related to faith. Your heart is related to conscience. So you have to take care of those four things sometimes to have your heart in a proper place before you can exercise your spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's good to know these things, right? Many of you are here in college and you want to get an education. I would say also you should get a spiritual education, yeah, right? Yeah. Learn these basics. Yeah. Um, learn to have a good foundation. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in school, you know, we had like this core curriculum that we kind of wanted everyone to go through. We covered certain matters related to the spirit, to the soul, to God's economy, to the church. And so that was like, oh, like go through that curriculum. It's like you would know, right? Not just know the difference on paper, like all the different functions, but even in your experience, like in the mornings, how can I touch the Lord with my spirit? Right? How do I exercise my heart in the right way so that I can touch the Lord with my spirit? Mm -hmm. um, and so we should have that aspiration, right? So don't you want to know these things? Not just in knowledge, but also in experience? Mm -hmm. Another matter... Oops. So oh. what do we do about that slide? Is that, we really only need those two, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for your car? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the spirit is the engine, so you just need to turn the ignition. Yeah. yeah. And I hope that all of us will learn what is the ignition in our being. That we really know how to touch our spirit in the right way. But also, we would also know how to exercise our heart and our spirit, yeah. or our soul, before we yeah. right. and to know the difference. Just like in a car. You know, if my car is like out of gas, do I change the oil? <laughs> Spiritually, it's the same thing. It's like there's things we have to do to deal with our mind, to deal with our emotion and our will. And so again, it's like, do I change the oil? It's like, no, you know, you might have a problem with your emotion. So you've got to deal with your emotion before the Lord. Yeah. Um, and before that, maybe that's the problem. Um, but then once your heart is in a proper place, you can touch the Lord. The other matter here of knowing the difference between our spirit and our soul, I just want to give a plug also for reading the word. Um, Harris, can you read Hebrews 4? Mm -hmm. For the word of God is living and operative and sharper than any two-edged sword, mm -hmm. and piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit, mm -hmm. and of joints and marrow, and able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Amen. 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 So we can see here that the word of God can divide our soul from our spirit. And so, <clears throat> what's happened is um, our soul and our spirit have become joined together. And so by reading the Word of God, it actually has an effect. That it starts to divide the two. And that you start to help know the difference. And it's very mysterious, but it's real. And it's just like when I eat a meal, and there's a process of digestion, I don't have to think about the metabolism that's taking place. In the same way, as we read the Word of God, there's a process that happens in our inner being that divides our spirit from our soul. 
Let me talk a little bit more then at the end here about, you know, maybe let's look at this, the parts of our being through the fall of man. So, um, I'm going to need a few volunteers here. Uh, maybe I will get you four sisters. Genesis, God created man. And I didn't put the verse on there, but what does it say? It says that he formed man out of the dust of the earth, right? And then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then it says man became a living soul. Right? So in terms of the parts of man, what did he do? He took the dust of the earth to form the body of man. Right? Then he breathed into him. Now in the Bible, another verse tells us that the breath of God is the lamp of Jehovah. And the word breath is the same word for spirit. And so actually, by breathing into man, he had, he gave him a spirit. And then when the spirit contacted the body, then the soul was created. So that's the interface between the soul and the spirit. So now you have man of three parts, spirit, soul, and body, in Genesis. Right? And then, of course, God wanted, what, what did God want man to do? He put him in front of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he wanted him to receive of the tree of life. Right? So take, the, take life and be filled. Be filled in your spirit with life. We know that man fell. Um, and so what happened when man fell, right, was that they were there in the garden. And so these three can represent Eve. Um, and so, let's see. One of you will be the spirit. One of you will be the soul. And one of you will be the body. So, let's see. Uh, it's the life of the spirit, soul, and body. All right, so you hold that up. All right, so three parts, right? And Eve is there in the garden. And of course, Satan is more crafty than all the an other animals. So he comes and he tempts Eve, right? So, Nate, read the first one and read it loudly. The serpent said to the woman, Did God really say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? So, what does Satan do here? He asks Eve a question. He said, Did God really say? What he does is he gets her into her mind. Right? That's what he's doing. He's activating her mind. God wanted man to live by his spirit. To have the spirit be the lead. And so in some ways, the spirit is the person. You hold that. Right? Um, but what Satan did, he tried to get man into the soul. So let me ask you a question. Um, Harris. Is it wrong to watch TikTok videos? You're <laughs> <laughs> getting where I'm getting. Okay. No. 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 Why? I mean, it depends on how wide you're talking about every video, all the videos. <laughs> <laughs> just some part of it, you know, yeah. I'll ask another question. Okay. okay. The whole group. Okay. If you see a dollar on the floor, is it wrong to pick it up and take it? Take over. <laughs> Put it in your pocket. Uh, is it wrong to skip a meeting, maybe on a Sunday morning, to study? <laughs> or if you're not ready for your final? So anyways, did God really say? Right, a lot of times, right away it gets us in our mind. Right, TikTok. Oh, well, it kind of depends on what channels you watch. or Well, if it's like this or that, right? But the Lord wants us to be those who are governed by our spirit. Right? So is it wrong to skip a meeting? No. But the Lord wants us to be those who follow him by the sense of life. Amen. Right? He wants us to be ruled and governed by our spirit first and not by our mind. Amen. So did God really say? Right? 
You could ask you endless questions, right? Yeah. Is it right or wrong to do this? Yeah. Or does God really say, does the Bible really say this? Yeah. Right? But what is the primary part of our being that we want to lead with? It's always our spirit. Yeah. Yeah. So, maybe sometimes it's okay to listen to me. I don't know. But if you're, you know, but what matters is whether you're doing it in the spirit. Yeah. All right, so now you got Eve in, his, in her mind. So, all right, Nate, read the next one. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Alright, so what's another part of our of our soul, Emma, besides the mind? Goodness. Um would it be like our actions or something? Almost. There's the mind. Emotions. Emotion, that's right. So you see what Satan's doing here? First, he activates her mind, gets her out of her spirit. So now her soul is the one taking the leap. Gets her in her mind, and, says, and then he says, you shall not surely die. At that point now, he just flat out lies, right? Or, um, but God knows in the day you eat of it, you'll be like him. So he stirs up her emotion, gets her to not like God. God's lying to you. He doesn't have your best intention. So now her emotion is stirred up. She's like, I don't like God. She's bothered, right? And then now, Nate, read the third one. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make oneself wise. Yep. So then, this is her will. Right? She saw the tree was desirable. Something that she desired, she wanted, she chose it. And so now she activates her will to choose the tree of knowledge. And then, Nate, read the next one. The woman took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. So, I guess I could have had like three more people up here, right? For the mind, emotion, and love. <laughs> <laughs> so she makes a choice. She takes the tree of, good, uh, of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. So she, all three of her being, right? Satan knows. He gets her out of her spirit, makes her way through her mind, emotion, and will. And then when she takes and eats of it, right? Now she's physically eating of it in her body. And then what happens then? Oh, actually, so she eats of the tree. Okay, so this is the part where then something happens. Man changes as a result of taking that in, right? So the body becomes the flesh. Um, the spirit dies. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> so now the spirit dies. Um, and then here, you hold this on top. Person moves over there. So our whole, all three parts of our being change as a result of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Nate, read the last one. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. So the spirit dies, and that's what the Lord meant. He said that you'll die. He didn't mean you'll physically die, but your spirit becomes dead. And then what happens is, instead of the spirit being the main person, the soul now becomes the person, mm -hmm. which was never in God's intention. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about what fallen man is, and all of us, um, before we were saved, we lived and breathed and acted out of our soul. Right. right? Yeah. We, that was the main seat of our personality. And we made the decisions, the spirit was dead, and we commanded the body, whatever it was to do. So, this is what happens to fallen man. So, now, what is God doing? Right, so when the spirit died, actually, he preserved one part, which was the conscience and the heart and the interface. And so one day, someone comes and preaches the gospel to you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They tell you something wonderful about Christ, about everything that Christ has done, about his redemption, his love, his forgiveness, right? And he also convicts you, activates your conscience. That's why in the gospel, when you teach the gospel, you always want to touch the conscience, activate that. So now the Lord as the Spirit can then get in mm. to your human spirit, mm. right? And now the Spirit becomes re-enlightened. And now, and now every day what we're learning is, where is the person? The soul or the Spirit? We're learning. And so what the Lord desires is the person would be the Spirit. Our soul is still there. Right. That means, but it's no longer the person. Mm -hmm. What that means is that the faculties of our soul, the mind, emotion, and will, 
are still there, but they're being used by the Spirit. Right. And so now the Spirit then imparts itself into our soul to renew our thoughts and our thinking. So our thoughts are no longer our own, whatever our soul desires, but our person is in our spirit, and our thoughts get renewed. So that our thoughts are like the thoughts of Christ. Yeah. Our feelings, our emotions, are the emotions of Christ. Yeah. And the choices that we make are the choices of Christ as our person. Yeah. So our faculties still stay there, but the person has been crucified, and the faculties now are under the guidance of the Spirit, yeah. under the direction of the Spirit. Yeah. So this is what the Lord is bringing us into, and this is why it's so important for us to know the difference between our spirit and our soul. Mm -hmm. We have to know the faculties of our mind, emotion, and will, but even to the point where now they're governed under the spirit. So, wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is what the Lord is doing. All right. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>